the paper record, New York Times. Look at look at look at the 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 the, 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 the Moloch right there. That, that's next level. Here's why: it's a desecration. It's a desecration of Independence Hall. This with the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Liberty Bell. Goes to Philadelphia, a city that's in chaos and, and, and collapsing all around you. It's crime and anarchy takes over. And he goes there. That's Moloch. Look at that. They did that on purpose. It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. And it absolutely will not stop. Ever. You are dead. Trump. There's no way out. So, my name is Ben Burgess. This is Give Them an Argument. I am joined, as always, by our super producer, Jake Appett, and our graphic designer, J. Andrew World. Um, what you just saw, of course, were clips from our Supreme Leader, Joe Brandon's um, big speech announcing the first annual Republican purge. Any thoughts? I am ready for it. I got myself my gun and my flail, and I'm going to be out there, you know, purging away. Yeah, good. Holiday spirit. Yeah, un unlike Andy, I had to purchase my uh, purge equipment uh, after I heard about it. Andy just had it on deck already in the, in the basement. I'm so. still spray painting my mask, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Liberals, yeah. of the liberals of the world unite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is fairly amazing. Um, you know, I mean, I think obviously, you know, we played that uh, clip. The uh, the second half of that is a video from uh, Soak Done Left, I think is uh, is how you say it. We'll uh, we'll we'll tweet out a link to it. But um, you know, I I do find a lot of the dark branded stuff funny. Although I also think there's the psychologically there's an element there of like, okay. Um, it's all sort of drenched in irony, but, uh, but is there a, um, you know, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's some weird wish fulfillment stuff going on there, but, uh, but in any case, uh, I, it is amazing watching the conservative reactions to the speech. Like, like Steve Bannon is like, you know, middle of the pack in terms of how unhinged that was. Uh, you know, I saw, I saw quite a few people uh, making Hitler comparisons um, there. Um, you know, I, I think Ben Shapiro said that the president talked about, you know, uh, the 74 million vote people who voted for Trump, like they were sewer rats. Uh, they, uh, there was a lot of talk about crossing the line, crossing the Rubicon. And it's like, look, I, I realized that uh, Biden's people were kind of like fucking with the conservatives by using the dark brand and red light backlighting, right? I mean, that I, I do think they knew what they were doing there. Uh, but the actual content of the speech was absolutely nothing that uh, Supreme Leader Brandon has not been saying continuously since he announced for president in 2019. Uh, his, uh, his first ad, right, like the announcement ad, uh, he was talking about Charlottesville. Uh, and this is... This exact, uh, <laughs> um, sorry, I just saw that, uh, the, uh, the chat there, um, this exact combination, right? This exact incoherent combination of a mega Republicans are a unprecedented threat to the Republic, but also B, um, I, Joe Biden will totally be able to work in bipartisan fashion with Republicans, even though C, also the MAGA people have completely taken over the Republican Party. Like, I, I don't understand how all three of these could be true, but uh, but Joe Biden has been continuously saying all three, like nonstop uh, since, he, uh, since he announced for president. There's absolutely nothing new in this speech. Um, and, and I actually think the best, the best take I saw on it was uh, Bronco Markatich uh, had a article in uh, in Jacobin, uh, Greetings Strom, 
called uh, it was something like what is what's the point of um, what was the point of Joe Biden's MAGA speech where he you know he points out this this you know incoherent combination of uh, of claims. But then he does something really interesting at the end, which is that he he contrasts it with the speech that Bernie Sanders made, I think almost the same day, uh, in uh, in the UK, where he'd gone to do some international solidarity with the uh, the RMT workers, um, and uh, it was it was funny. We we don't have this clip. I didn't think of it, but uh, the uh, when we were preparing for the show, but uh, but in. Um, but there's a great clip going around of uh, of of Sanders uh, code switching for his audience, and you know he's talking about like economic inequality and worker struggles in the U.S. and the U.K. and he says it's the same bloody thing. Uh, but um, but you contrast the actual content of the Sanders speech, like Bronco does there, to the Biden speech, and it is just pretty much pretty amazing, right? How how much more substantive uh, the uh, the Bernie one is. But uh, speaking of um, Branko Markatic and speaking of Jacobin, I co-wrote an article with, uh, with Branko that came out uh, a little over a week ago, I think, um, which, uh, which was called uh, student, uh, student Debt Forgiveness uh, Was Never Supposed to Happen. No, that's not the one. Um, it's, uh, yep, Student Debt Relief Was Never Supposed to Happen. And uh, what we're doing in that article is is looking back at the way that liberals have talked about this issue uh, over the course of, you know, well, how they were talking about this issue in 2016 versus right now when Biden did it. He did it in a needlessly conservative way. It shouldn't have been means tested. It should have been completely universal. Uh, it shouldn't have been just the first 10,000. It should have been everything. But he actually did implement it, and you know, in a pretty serious way. Like, uh, there are people for whom ten thousand dollars barely scratches the surface. There are plenty of people like that, but there are also uh, there are also plenty of people for whom this wipes out their entire student debt. Um, and back in two thousand and sixteen, there's this John Oliver clip. Uh, I think we have just a little bit of that prepared. Using it the way that she's describing amounts to a president unilaterally passing a new law and funding it by printing new money. And the, the dangers of that should be pretty obvious. In terms of how fundamentally flawed that is on every level, it's basically akin to saying, I'll make us energy independent by ordering the post office to invade Canada. <laughs> no, Jill, that's impractical, it's a terrible idea, and you don't seem to understand anything about it. So that was um, beloved uh, liberal uh, comedian commentator um, John Oliver in 2016 mocking the Green Party's presidential candidate Jill Stein for saying that as president she would take unilateral action to cancel student debt. Um, in yeah, and, you know, granted, what she was going to do was um, get the Fed to use quantitative easing. Uh, and so there's like a very narrow argument that Oliver could make that, well, a uh, president can't directly, you know, order the Fed to do that, but, uh, also presidents pressure the Fed to do things all the time. Uh, that's, that's not a crazy idea. Um, and as we just saw, you know, and like, even if you don't think you could do it that way, as we just saw with Biden, there are other mechanisms that the president can use to do this unilaterally. And in 2016, John Oliver and you know, and, and an audience full of with an audience full of liberals laughing and clapping, right, was comparing the idea of the president unilaterally forgiving student loans to um, the president ordering the post office to invade Canada. Um, there's a there's later on in the clip uh, he he says uh, if if we just let people print money like this, you know, then like. Maybe this is a very 2016 reference that uh, that you know Tiger King, if uh, Joe Exotic, you know was 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 president, he could um, uh, he could make uh, he could um, just start printing money to finance a tiger orgy on the White House lawn, and so these were the kinds of comparisons liberals were making in 2016 to this like insane radical idea of just uh, the, the government just writing off uh, student loan debt. And you know, and I think that that is actually kind of encouraging, right? Like, is it uh, it it shows how how far 
the ball could be moved on this stuff, right? That like uh, over the uh, over the course of time, my uh, my dog is scratching at the floor very loudly right now. But uh, over, I don't know, I don't know how much the mic is picking it up. But uh, yeah, okay. Over the course of time, um, like this has moved, right? People talk about the Overton window, and I've been critical of some of the ways that people use that phrase. But I mean, I think it is clearly true that you know. The, the stupid way of talking about the Overton window is like we just say the most extreme stuff we can think of and that way that'll somehow make the stuff that's halfway there happen. And I don't think that works. But I think if you, I think that if radicals propose ideas that actually make sense, that uh, resonate with people over the course of time, yeah, I do think the window of what's politically possible can shift quite a bit, you know, if events in the larger world play along as they have here. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, like like uh, Jill Stein also brought us the the Green New Deal language. Yeah, which, uh, she did. You know, we, we've also, adu- you know, which is also now political norm and, and uh, 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 Biden kind of uh, sidestepped it a little bit, but that's OK. It, it's, it's, we, we've it's gotten, to, you know, towards mainstream as opposed to a fringe <laughs> idea as it was back in 2012 when she first kind of brought it up. Yeah, in, 20, in 2012, nobody was. um uh, yeah, in 2012, nobody, um, like, there weren't any congressmen who were talking about doing a Green New Deal. Yeah, we really didn't have any hope of any congressmen doing, talking about it either. Yeah, very true. Okay, uh, well, uh, I also um, wrote a bunch of other stuff uh, about the student debt relief um, for, for Jacobin. Uh, we'll just run through it real quickly. So the first one is the one we had up earlier. That's the uh, one that says Biden is canceling $10,000 of student loan debt for some borrowers. That's not good enough. Uh, I will say, um, you know, I always like put in a suggested headline when I, when I file one of these things and, you know, about half the time they don't take it, which is fine. Right. I think most people who know how this works know that writers don't write headlines. I will say in this case, the original headline uh, that I'd suggest was that's good, but not good enough. And I think that good, but is actually important here. And I think it's reflected in the article. But, you know, it makes the case uh, for uh, for making it completely universal. Uh, and then uh, the next one should um, was um, was basically an article that was about uh, the ways in which, you know, was like sort of taking on all of the, um, yeah, is the medical debt one. It says, uh, yeah, yes, canceling student loan debt is justified. Canceling medical debt would be too. And it's an attempt to both debunk a lot of the standard arguments against canceling student debt. Oh, it's regressive. You're, you know, you're helping people who don't need help. Um, and, um, you know, why, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And also an attempt to say, look, I, I think that's a bullshit argument. I think that the, I think that, um, because we should never have been shaking people down for payments to go to college in the first place, just like we don't for high school. Um, and we'd all, you know, if in some dystopian timeline where they did start charging tuition for high school, for public high schools. And like, um, if you couldn't afford it, like you, you had to like then spend years or decades paying it off. Right. I mean, I, I think we'd all see the issue very clearly there. So because it shouldn't, the, because this is something people should never have been charged for in the first place. We shouldn't just keep shaking people down to pay it off forever. Um, and, but then I think there is a germ of truth in the regressiveness argument, which is just to say, yeah, I think it's bad if the only people that we're helping, you know, by writing them off their debts are people who went to college, right? But there are lots of other kinds of debt that we could do this with too. The obvious case would be medical debt uh, because it's exactly the same argument that uh, people shouldn't have been charged for this in the first place. Uh, and so you shouldn't keep holding them up for this debt, for this thing they should have never been charged for in the first place. Uh, and um, and that's something that the majority of people have have at least some medical debt, you know? So um, so there's, there's certainly no, uh, and, you know, in fact, you're more likely to if you don't have insurance. Although you can also have insurance and, you know, get... Um, have a medical emergency while the nearest ho- you know hospital is out of network. There are lots of ways you can end up with crazy medical debt, you know, with, um, you know, despite having insurance, but, uh, but, you know, it certainly wouldn't apply there. So, I mean, I think that should be the response. Like, yeah, 
we should absolutely cancel student loan debt, all of it, right? But uh, but you know, but the, we shouldn't stop at canceling student loan debt. And then the last one uh, was um, uh, was about uh, something that was actually uh, surprisingly politically competent that the uh, that the Biden White House Twitter account did, where they uh, named and shamed all these conservative congressmen who'd uh, who'd been. Um, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, people like that, who had uh, had massive amounts of uh, of uh, PPP loans forgiven for their businesses, um, who were tweeting about how irresponsible it was uh, to uh, to write off student debt. Um, and there's this argument that people like Ben Shapiro were making uh, that oh that's not at all the same thing because see the government made people shut down so uh, so actually uh, it's it's totally fine to write off PPP debt you know but it's it's very irresponsible to you know uh, let people get away with not paying back uh, their student loan debt and the article is clearly engaging with that and and sort of showing well no um, none of the sort of general everybody should always have to pay back their debts their arguments that conservatives make would actually only like, there's no principled way of saying that applies to student loan debt, but not PPP debt, right? That the, um, like, if anything, right, their argument seems to be, well, if we think that the assistance should have been offered outright in this case, they think because the government paid people shut down or whatever, if we think the assistance should have been offered outright instead of being made a loan, then you shouldn't be held up for repayment, which is a principle I'm perfectly happy to get on board with, but that would also apply to, uh, to students uh, student loan debt. Uh, okay. Uh, speaking of conservative hypocrisy, I uh, have a article that came out uh, this morning for Labor Day in the Daily Beast. Um, so uh, that is now that is an old Daily Beast. Uh, the here it is. Uh, if you care about free speech, make it harder to fire people for unpopular opinions. And uh, in that article, I go back and look at statements by Ben Shapiro, by Charlie Kirk, by Sean Hannity, about how very much all these people supposedly care about free speech. And, you know, make a very simple point about this, which is, come on, guys, if you, uh, if you actually cared about free speech, well, look, what's the, you know, what's the consequence of expressing unpopular opinions that people are actually concerned with in America in 2022. And don't get me wrong, right? We do have a history of government repression. You could talk about, you know, the Palmer raids, um, you know, the, the Red Scare in the 50s with McCarthy, the uh, FBI's war against the Black Panther Party in the 70s. You could talk about the extradition attempt against Julian Assange now, right? Those are all like legitimate points. And, you know, so the United States is very, very far from being an ideally free and democratic country, but it's democratic enough that the vast majority of people, the vast majority of time are not realistically worried that if they say the wrong thing, they're going to get like thrown in jail, right? Or even if they go to a protest march or whatever. The, the realistic concern that most people are going to have is not at all that, right? It's that they're going to lose their job. And there is a solution to this. Right, Jake. Pop quiz. What's the uh, what's the solution? What's the solution to uh, to you know it being too easy to fire people? It's me and Andy unionizing the uh, GTAA uh, pod. No, it's uh, forming a Ooh, union. Well, see, the problem is technically you're independent contractors. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's all of those. Uh, you know, only only if the NLRB legally allows you. You know, no, no. It's uh, yeah. It's 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 to uh, form a union so that you have due process and that if uh, your employer saw you at the wrong march, let's say, any of any political uh, stripe, mm -hmm. that they cannot decide to let you go without due process. And most likely you'll have something in your contract that has, uh, you know, the real real reasons why you could be let go of actually not doing your job, of not, you know, you didn't uh, bake, you know, you didn't bake any cakes this week and you, you, you're, you're a baker, right? You probably can't yeah, do yeah. that forever and uh, keep your job, but, you know, you could go to the... Uh, Dark Brandon uh, March. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and it's a part of Dark Brandon, and you won't lose your yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. Right? You so. You're not going to get fired for attending the pro purge uh, rally. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. Uh, and 
And I think it is worth taking a minute here, right? Uh, and there's more substantive things to say about this. And I know, I know you have stuff to say about it, you know, but uh, I, I think it is worth just taking a minute to actually consider how much progress has been made since like Labor Day 2021, right? Um, and, you know, don't get me wrong. I know it's like a drop in the bucket of what needs to happen. You know, the overall private sector unionization rate is, you know, not any better, right? You know, than, uh, than, than it was, right? It's, it, you know, we're not talking about enough to actually impact that yet, you know, but, um, but like, you know, it's so easy to just get, um, sort of cynical and uh, nihilistic about this stuff. Um, but there is just a remarkable amount of, uh, of labor victories that, that have happened in, uh, in the last, in the last 12 months. I mean, Jake, do you want to, do you want to run us through some of the highlights of that? Yeah. Let me play my 10. So I was really caffeinated before we did the show. So there's a lot of, uh, extra extra energy gone into some of the cuts so here's our labor day 2022 all right um nice. uh so uh this is uh, all credit to more perfect union for kind of doing a roundup uh yep. we ben stop me when when it gets too much which is a good thing right that we even have that yeah. much uh but so workers at more than 235 Starbucks stores have unionized in 33 states. And there's uh, elections have been filed in nearly 100 more. Um, as of last Labor Day, there were zero unionized Starbucks locations in the United States. Bam. April, Amazon workers uh, at JFK work, uh, Warehouse in Staten Island made history when they voted to form the first unionized Amazon Warehouse. Uh, you saw Christian Smalls in the, in the, in the video uh, just play pop and some champagne. Uh, this summer, Trader Joe's workers in Massachusetts voted to form the company's first union ever. Uh, Minneapolis, Trader Joe's overwhelmingly uh, voted to form the second. Uh, REI workers in New York City, Chipotle workers in Michigan just won their first union. Yeah. Retail uh, in, workers uh, in, in Lansing, Michigan, which is, uh, which, which is my hometown. Yeah, I think they were waving the dark Burgess flag, right, as they, as they stormed uh, – <laughs> <laughs> they stormed the Chipotle. Um, That's right. And then uh, retail workers in Maryland uh, voted to form the first Apple Store union. So those are some of the uh, some of the biggest victories. And to your point, Ben, I mean, I think, you know, it's not like all Starbucks. Uh, it's not like enough Starbucks have been organized such that it really affected the private uh, sector unionization rate yet. Right. Um, but the fact that th these this kind of movement was considered impossible, right? That you'd have yeah. this many Starbucks, even by a lot of people on the left, uh, labor, totally. you know, labor, that, that there'd be this many Starbucks organized. They they were saying, that's a cute flash in the pan, but, you know, let's look at some real stuff, right? Um, totally. So, was, so it, means, was, it means a lot, yeah. I was I was hearing a lot of that stuff, I remember, even in December of, uh, of last year when uh, when I think at that point there was, there was still just one... Uh, Union I Starbucks, or maybe there were like two, but they have, um, but I think it was just one. And, and I, I had an argument with, uh, a person I'm not going to name, but, uh, but, but I was, I was, no. I was, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, shake chap it. Uh, <laughs> no, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. I was, I was with you on this, but go ahead. Yeah, no, you actually were. Uh, the, uh and, but, Certain other people, uh, also also not Andy, you know, but certain other people um, whose whose names you'd recognize from magazines that you read and podcasts you listen to, uh, were not. And and I remember having a big argument right at a bar in Los Angeles uh, in December with one of these people about it, where he was like, ah, you know, that's nothing's going to happen. That's like one place, and like they're not, you know, like it's. Uh, it's it's not really uh, it's not really going to spread, and I get it, right? Because like you've you've got, I mean, we just came out of um, like 2019, uh, the uh, the absolute boy goes down in flames in Great Britain. 2020, uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign comes heartbreakingly close and then fails. Um, the in uh, what was like early 2021, I think was that, was that first, uh, was the, uh, Bessemer, um, 
uh, the Bessemer, Alabama attempt to uh, to unionize Amazon. Uh, like there, there have just been such a uh, kind of mind numbing string of defeats, right? I mean, then like you know, it can be very easy to just like sound like common sense, right? To say, well, you know, nothing good is going to happen, but you know, sometimes it does. And I think, uh, honestly, I think we kind of owe it to people if we're in a position of like having any kind of platform uh, to to play that up, right? You know, and like and like actually, you know, because you know, I mean, like. I think um, like Chris Smalls, right? Seeing popping champagne and in, uh, in that video that we just watched. Um, first time I ever heard of Chris Smalls, he was on the uh, Zero Books podcast being interviewed by Doug Lane, um, which, you know, no shade on Doug, you know, that's, but that's, that's not exactly, uh, that's not exactly household name territory. And in, uh, in that case, like, and I, I remember hearing that, I was like, oh man, that really sucks what happened to that guy. Right. You know, but I, I didn't think much of it right at the, at the time. Right. I certainly didn't think he was going to, uh, to lead a successful campaign to, uh, to unionize, uh, his, uh, his warehouse when I first heard that interview and whatever that was 2018 or something. So, um, this, uh, yeah, I, I, I think we, I actually think that there is some kind of obligation to like, you know, if you see what you're doing, not just as entertainment, but as serving a political project, I actually think there is some obligation to like play up these victories when they happen uh, and, and sort of help remind people that they're happening. So that's my, uh, that's my two cents, but I, I, I know you have some actual like strategic thoughts about all of this. Um, you know, just, you know, uh, for my lifetime in the labor movement, no, I could give maybe a, a little bit of my perspective as having been a labor organizer uh, for a few years, because I think a lot of people question, right, like, what is the, what are the role of socialists or socialists just like LARPers talking on YouTube channels uh, who, who don't have any, oh, where'd Ben go? Ben did not like what I was saying. I'm actually going to intentionally go off screen for like 10 seconds, but I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Then I'm going to make my big point. Dark, dark Abbott. Um, so uh, yeah. So I think a lot of people, Andy, uh, you know, question what are the role of uh, socialists, uh, you know, in actual left-wing movements. So I just want to say like, as a labor organizer and just as someone who's following the news, most of these campaigns have had lots of socialists and lots of leftists involved with them. Right. And these are, these are workers, you know, workers at Chipotle. I know I saw at the first uh, Chipotle store that unionized, I think uh, the worker was a DSA member or at least shouted out the local DSA chapter for helping them organize. I know as a labor organizer, whenever I found out that like a worker committee had a socialist or a DSA member or any other kind of uh, leftist like on the committee, I was like, this is really, really helpful, right? Like it's really, really good. It's not just like some kind of... Uh, it's not just like some kind of ivory tower academic thing. Like it's really good to have uh, a socialist on the team. Um, so I think, especially in the moment that we have a head, uh, have a head, like I saw a labor reporter, a friend of mine, uh, Jonah Furman was saying that, you know, Starbucks uh, started to fire uh, a lot of the um, organizers uh, or, or, you know, the worker organizers at Starbucks who, who spearheaded these movements, they started just fucking firing them, maybe, you know, going to start closing down stores. So the question is, is this going to be some kind of a Patco moment, you know, um, like what's going to happen when uh, Starbucks really brings down the hammer, right? And I think, you know, if, if, if you're really wondering, is this a threat to corporate interests, just look at what these corporate interests, corporate interests are doing in response, right? If they're firing workers, if they're closing down stores, if they're trying to break the law, uh, it was just ruled that Amazon broke the law at another Staten Island Amazon uh, organizing drive that, you know, it means that they're scared, right? But the point is, is that they're going to start fighting back harder. And it's really amazing to see, like at Starbucks, they're just fucking going on strike in response to some of these workers getting fired. Uh, and, you know, it helps that the NLRB has some good, um, has, has had some good decisions, has been reinstating some workers, but you can't always rely on the NLRB. So we're going to need to have a radical consciousness, you know, at least embedded I think, in these movements, and they're already embedded in these movements. Uh, but the last thing I would say, too, is, you know, not to uh, have that be too much of a shibboleth, because my most successful organizing campaign was led by basically, like, Warren supporting progressives, right? Uh, so I think it's not about being like, oh, these workers have to have the perfect, uh, you know, no organizing campaign that is perfect and has the perfect leftist of the perfect sect. But I think that, you know, it's good. To, it, there is a role for leftists, uh, actual on the working um, on the organizing committees. Um, 
but we also have to be kind of in coalition with other like-minded folks who maybe aren't exactly, you know, they might not even like Bernie, they might even be conservative. Uh, Ben's going to uh, maybe get into some of those debates, you know, about uh, later uh, about, you know, some of these socially conservative workers. Um, I, I, I'm, I agree with Ben, I think, um, as you'll see, you know, they're going to be talking about uh, uh, right wing social democracy. I don't love that, but I definitely welcomed a, a worker activist who was socially conservative if that was, you know, I mean, uh, when I was an organizer, I, I wouldn't let them cross certain lines. Right. And then I would say that's not welcome here. But if they left that out and said, I'm here for the union and like, I'm, I'm going to show up, uh, then they were welcome, you know. So that's my little rant on uh, leftists in the labor movement. But hopefully because I'm we're just going to have to like steal ourselves or, or the workers are going to have to steal themselves and whatever we could do to be in solidarity because it's going to be a long fight. The last thing I want to say, though, is when I started working uh here, uh, one of the workers that I had been organizing was like, oh, that's like really awesome. You know, like I watch I watch Burgess, like that's really cool that you're on it. So I just see, you know, sometimes I think people will underestimate and say like, mm -hmm. oh, no one, no one who really matters is watching these type of channels. And all of our debates are just for like leftists at, mm -hmm. in the academy or, or, you know, grad students or not that grad students aren't sometimes a proletariat as well, but you know what I mean? And sure. I don't think, and obviously that's a lot of it, but like a lot of the workers who might be consuming a lot of stuff on YouTube might be the ones who are, you know, gaining consciousness and they're going to have to like steal their coworkers when it's like, damn, like a bunch of my coworkers just got fired. Am I in it? Or am I just going to give up because like, I'm not seeing those tangible gains right now is literally fired. Right. So you got to be about the movement and not just about the individual location. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I, I think, um, and yeah, I mean, I think obviously you do want to, um, you know, look, plenty of, plenty of workers are conservatives. I think they, I think the approach that you, you like laid out in there makes perfect sense to me. Um, yeah, Sora Bamari, who we're going to have on in a few minutes, uh, he, uh, his, his daughter isn't asleep yet. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a few more minutes until he can join us. But, um, is somebody who, um, as you uh, as you indicate, I have a ton of those uh, disagreements with, and you know, and we'll 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 obviously uh, we'll obviously get into that, right? You know, but like, look, I mean, if there was a, if there's if you're on a, um, you know, if you tried to organize a uh, you know a, a Starbucks and you know and and somebody, I don't know, you do meet somebody who reads Compact and uh, and they they uh, like they agree with that whole combination of views. That's like, all right, well, you know. Maybe sometime we can get a beer and argue about, uh, you know, to argue about you know, certain aspects of that. But if all that leads you to support the union effort, I'm all for it. Yeah, hundred percent. Now, like I said, I personally, as an organizer, um, maybe I actually didn't draw lines where I was, you know, too scared or didn't want to hurt the movement. Sure. But I believe personally in like. No, I mean, it's, it's, there, are, it's, there are lines to be drawn for sure, right? But like they, but you know, I, I think there's also got to be a balance. I mean, as we've yeah. as we've talked about before. You know, one of um, you know, like I don't know. I think like something like forty percent of the uh, of the John Deere strikers uh, were uh, had been had been Trump voters, right? You know, like was was the number that I saw in uh, breaking points. So, I mean, I think that there's, um, you know, I mean, I think that like obviously there's a point where it becomes a problem, uh, and and you do have to draw some lines. But I I also think that uh, you're you're I think it makes sense for your default. <laughs> to be like, okay, well, we'll argue about that later, right? Right now, uh, you know, right now, like, welcome aboard. Yeah, um, and uh, I'll, Andy, I don't know if you are going to say something, I didn't want to cut you off, but uh, no, it's just, uh, it, it might be a, a, a surprise to some folks that I've, I'm no longer a labor organizer. I decided that I the front lines of the of the battle were in grad school for uh, creative writing and fiction. So that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> the most that's important where, way, this is the most important thing you can do to for a podcaster yes so, podcasters yeah. uh lining up but yeah but um no um but you know while i was uh, uh employed as an organizer I, as at a certain point i had a reputation of like oh he can talk to the trump he could talk to the trump guys like he could see he, he could go and talk to them uh then i could go and organize them and get them to sign a card so i guess uh, i was an expert at throwing my own personal uh, values out the window and, and finding finding a common ground that might have been a little overblown um, but, uh, it, it was funny. It was like, all right, he'll do it. You know, <laughs> like he'll, like I'll go in and, and actually just talk to them and, and, and steer clear of stuff that's yeah. you know going to be offensive or whatever. So, uh, like I did organizing in like rural Tennessee, for example. So, uh, yeah, I definitely saw some examples of, uh, 
reaching across those, those aisles. But Andy didn't want to cut you off. No, I, I mean, the only thing I really have to add is, you know, you can't go on strike with the, uh, with, with the uh, uh, union you want, but you got to go on strike with the union you got. So, you know, that you have. Uh, th- thanks to the immortal words by, uh, uh, was that uh, Astro? Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld? I can't remember. Yeah, it's Rob Rumsfeld. <laughs> Rubby Rum. Go to war with the army that you want. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, okay. Sora is backstage. Let's just run through the last couple topics, uh, pretty quickly, uh, since we actually want to, uh, after we're done talking to him, want to, since it is Labor Day, I want to end the main show probably about 20 minutes early tonight, uh, and, uh, and then do a short crew only post game. We're going to toast, uh, Jake's, uh, one year anniversary as uh, GTA producer. Also got some stuff uh, about um, Anna Kasparian and Dennis Prager uh, to, uh, to to get to, which should be fun. Uh, but yeah, so uh, there are uh, two uh, two other articles that I had out in uh, Jacobin since last episode. Uh, one of them was about Ron DeSantis. Uh, they did not go with uh, you know my suggested him that, which was DeSantis versus Democracy. I thought it was nice and you know, punchy and uh, liberates. But uh, it's called Ron DeSantis' Voting Doug Crackdown is Grotesque. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. You can listen to me on David Feldman uh, from uh, the last episode, I believe, um, you know, the, the one uh, that recorded on Thursday last week, talking about that. And the second one, which just came out today, uh, is, um, is about uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, so, uh, that one, um, actually, hold on. We might have to do a screen share of that one. Just give me a second. Um, here we go. Uh, so that one is called, um, Gorbachev couldn't reform the Soviet system, uh, but a, uh, but a better socialism is, uh, is possible. Uh, and, um, and basically, um, Actually, this is this is kind of inspired by uh, by a, a, a tweet that I saw about this, which is linked at the um, at the beginning of um, you know that's linked at the uh, at the beginning of the article. I think we do have a graphic of the tweet, um, which uh, so this guy says a lesser man would have done way worse in the situation. There was no basis in the bureaucracy for the democratic reform he wanted. Stuck between hardliners and oligarchs and waiting, probably one of the most tragic figures of our time, fit for one of Shakespeare's histories, RIP. And the, the article is basically a defense of, uh, of that take, right? That this is like this fundamentally tragic figure who was at least trying to steer a third course between, um, you know, hardliners who thought that this deeply dysfunctional and authoritarian system that was resented by much of the population could just totter on the way it was forever and uh yeltsinites who are getting ready to uh loot the state treasury and, and and enrich themselves and and sort of create this uh really dystopian situation where like life expectancy in russia fell by five years uh on average in the 90s uh and you know like you'd see this series of headlines about you know um economic chaos and lawlessness and you know and people going months without getting paid and stuff that felt like it was something out of a dystopian science fiction novel. And so, you know, I, I think that um, in the article, I explore some of the reasons why maybe what Gorbachev wanted couldn't have worked. But, uh, but if, um, you know, maybe this, maybe the kind of resources weren't there in the situation for, for the, for that third path, who's trying to steer to happen. But at the very least, um, at the very least, he probably deserves to be remembered more warmly than either his Stalinist predecessors or his gangster capitalist successors, uh, and uh, and that's the that's the case that's uh, that's made in that article, along with kind of thinking about what a what a you know qualitatively better sort of socialism would look like. Yeah, I remember seeing a meme like right after he passed away, which uh, had him at Pizza Hut. And uh, uh, he's like, what's the matter? You're not eating your Pizza Hut pizza. And the child goes, it's because you betrayed the revolution. <laughs> yeah, uh, do, I, I do actually uh, I do actually link to the Pizza Hut commercial at the uh, at the end. Probably probably not his best moment. But uh, in any case, uh, all right, we are going to uh, to leave it there and uh, and uh, bring it bring on Saurabh. So uh, I will see you guys in the post game. All right, now joined by Sora Bamari, co-founder of Compact Magazine. Uh, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, Ben. How are you? Thanks for I, having me. I am pretty good. Um, 
So I should also say uh, Sorab is the author uh, of a book called The Unbroken Thread. I think we have that. Um, yep. Um, and, um, you know, and, and I, will say, I will say, I mean, I haven't read the whole thing, but I have, um, you know, like I, I read a fair amount, not a ton. I'm not Matt McManus, but I, I read, I try to read a fair number of conservative books just to kind of keep myself honest. And, uh, and, and usually it's a chore, but this is, uh, you know, just, just writing alone, right? You know, this, this, is, uh, this is much better. But, um, but yeah, so um, I want to just think about how to, how to set this up. Uh, and, and by the way, it is, a, it is a great shame. I think we have this clip that we're not doing this uh, in, uh, that, we're, that you know, we're doing this on the computer, not in person, because I, uh, I watched your, um, uh, I watched the debate that you did uh, with, uh, with, with David French. And uh, there's this moment at the beginning, uh, Jake, do we, uh, do we have the clip? I did bring David a gift because I dragged him into a debate <laughs> and uh, it was a necessary debate. I'm glad that I did, but I brought him some Kentucky uh, bourbon ah. just in a sense to, you know, to first of all, thank you for participating in the debate and also to thank you for your service to the country. So if you're if you're going around passing out bottles of uh, of nice bourbon to people that you do debates with, then it's a real shame that we're not doing it in person. But uh, in any case, uh, I did. Um, so so. I think probably the best sort of angle here would be if you filled us in a little bit about like what compact is and like what the sort of um, how you see the political project and like how it's kind of different from from what you know the sort of standard options. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I would have brought you. A, I don't know what your choice of choice is. David French is a is from Tennessee. Um, yeah, so well, there we go. The bur bourbon scene. Well, or maybe whiskey would have been more even more appropriate. But at any rate, um, yeah, I um, the project of of Compact is born of um, my and my partner Matthew Schmitz's primarily born of my and Matthew Schmitz's uh, frustration with actually existing conservatism. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is um, a great deal of conservative energy is devoted to um, lamenting various sort of cultural phenomena, you know, oh, family formation rates are declining, people aren't having children, people aren't getting married. Um, but the answer that the conservative movement has to these phenomena is just to say, you know, it's just we need to convince people that th these things are good. So we mm -hmm. just we haven't been saying it enough, like mm -hmm. more and louder. Um, when in fact, um, a, a more realistic analysis is that that um, these cultural phenomena, at least in part, reflect material conditions, um, and um, so that uh, you know it's it's no wonder that people aren't getting married when uh, uh, you know the especially among working and middle class people, when workers' share of the sort of social income has been um, on a sort of declining trajectory for for better part of two generations or when there's just this kind of fundamental sense of insecurity in American life material insecurity in American life those things have to be have to be addressed and the way we've sought mm -hmm. to the way we've come around to addressing them and that this is sort of shocking for people on the on the right to do um, I certainly don't consider myself a conservative anymore mm -hmm. in the sense of like a mm -hmm. kind of um, conserving what like the 1980s kind of Reaganite consensus certainly not uh, or, or what have you but in fact we we think and we say in our opening manifesto that um, the, the sort of the social democratic model the the, um, the attempt to compass economic ap activity within a broader political framework and to recognize first of all that economic life private economic life is in fact suffused with coercion it's not mm -hmm. centralized coercion, but it's nevertheless um, all pervasive. And therefore, um, what 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 did the sort of social democratic project or the New Deal, which you may mm -hmm. uh, we can sort of niggle over the fact that whether or not it's, it was actually counted as social democracy, but it was sort of the closest American analog. Mm -hmm. Both of those projects, what they attempted to do was to um, you know make it possible for workers and other weak actors to mount countervailing power against against employers um, 
uh, and um, other sort of powerful economic actors. And that 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 um, program yielded 30 years of broad-based prosperity, um, heavily unionized, heavily regulated capitalism, was in fact quite innovative and productive and and uh, and prosperous. Um, so that's our project, and it's very mm. much contrary um, to much of the right. And as as it's gone on, I think we've become much bolder in in challenging um, economic orthodoxies on the right, such that you know, like if you and I sat down on any number of economic issues, I would venture mm-hmm. to say that there's very little daylight between us. Yeah. So uh, so this is. Yeah, I want to explore that part a little bit uh, because, um, you know, I, I do. Um, so I should I should say uh, back in, uh, you know, when Compact was uh, was first in announced March. Uh, in, uh, in March, I, had, uh, I wrote, um, you know, I wrote something about it for uh, for for Jacobin. Uh, all credit for that. It'll goes to Micah Utrecht. Uh, stop trying to make right wing social democracy happen. It's not going to happen. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, which is a cr- critique based on the sort of obvious difference, you know, I think the obvious differences between, uh, between us on essentially cultural conservative, you know, like the sense in which you are a conservative, right? You know, the, the, the cultural issues and, you know, social policy, uh, issues, which obviously I want to get into, but I, I do want to explore the economic part for, for a minute, um, uh, first, because I am, I'm always curious about this, right? So, um, like, you know, I, I mean, I guess just like one way of doing this is just like, um, on, um, like, I don't know, like Medicare for all. Yay. Nay. Yes. Okay. Um, $15 minimum wage. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, student debt forgiveness. I would say if, if it's accompanied by, um, some measure of structural reform of how mm-hmm. we do higher education. Um, so I, I guess I, I, not easy to say yeah or nay on that one, but I've, sure. I've, 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 I've opposed the um, kind of blasé conservative attitude mm-hmm. of just like spoiled kids, like don't stop drinking lattes and right. pay your debts off. Right? It's ridiculous. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, and I think the only article, the only two articles we've run at Compact uh, have been um, favorable again in sort of nuanced ways. Yeah, I mean the one I read uh, was um, seemed to be seemed to be less favorable, uh, but it was um, you know I mean you didn't write it also, so yeah. uh, you you might not have completely the t- the same uh, take as this person did. So this is the uh, why the right uh, lost the uh, the student yeah. uh, the student loan fight, uh, and there does seem to be some suggestion in there that. Um, you know, of even though it's an attempt to sort of say, well, uh, you know, there's there's obviously criticism of the right in it, right? But it it's yeah. um, you know, but it also does seem to uh, to echo a lot more of this sort of uh, conservative pushback that is regressive and all of that stuff. But but okay, so that's like that's like pretty um, like that's pretty wide agreement, at least in terms of sort of short term um, policy. policy goals. Yeah, uh, I think that. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, based on what I've seen from you, whether the sort of like long-term horizons would quite be the same, but it's also a little bit, um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, sometimes in America in 2022, that feels a little bit like, you know, I don't know if you're like pay, playing pickup basketball and you're like, not only is it important to me that I would get into the NBA, but like it's, you know, but you know, I need to actually win a championship game. You know, it's like, okay, well, you know, I don't, I don't think even the first part is going to happen soon, you know? So, um, so, you know, I, I think that is like quite a bit of agreement, but of course where there's the disagreement mm-hmm. is, uh, so in the original, the statement from the founder, a uh, note from the founders that, uh, that was in uh, the, uh, the first, um, you know, that was, was posted the day the website was launched. Uh, it said your editorial changes, uh, editorial choices are shaped by a quote desire for a strong social democratic state. So far, so good. That defends community, local, national, familial, familial, and religious against a libertine left and a libertarian right. Uh, so um, certainly, uh, when you know, when I hear 
talk of defending, uh, you know, religious community mm -hmm. uh, and family against libertines. Uh, that that mm -hmm. sounds like uh, that sounds like there's going to be a bunch of stuff that I disagree with. Uh, that is mm -hmm. uh, that is that is coming, and certainly in that debate with uh, with David French that we we showed 12 seconds from the beginning of earlier, um, the the original you know the original subject was uh, was drag time. Uh, drag queen story hour at yes. uh, at uh, at public libraries uh which um you know which which seems fine to me you know it can like drag queens you know like reading to kids uh i don't i don't think reading you know i don't think reading to kids is bad i don't think drag queens uh, doing it is bad you know you obviously have a different perspective on that uh and i would assume right i mean if we just sort of did the same lightning round thing with with a bunch of social policy questions that um I mean the well, like for example, um, uh, legal abortion would mm -hmm. obviously be no, right? Yeah. Um, gay marriage. Correct. We would disagree on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and so I, so, um, so I think that I think there are like maybe two ways of going about this. One is to is to sort of like you know, talk about the actual substance of some of those issues, which we can do a little bit of, but also, um, but also on a sort of broader philosophical level, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think that, um, I think there was a, uh, um, you know, I, well, okay, so I, I did this article for, uh, for the Daily Beast a while back about uh, J.D. Vance, uh, who, mm -hmm. uh, of whom I am not a fan, mm -hmm. and I quoted something you'd said about him at the beginning of the article, and, and I think in the original quote, uh, there was, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I think that because there was a, like a link to you speaking at a national conservatism conference and, 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 and it, it used that label to describe you and you, uh, and, and you said, well, um, you know, can you change that? Which we did. Cause, cause you don't, you know, really see yourself even as conservative at all anymore, really. But like you, but the phrase you did ask for was post-liberal, right? Mm -hmm. So that this is, I think on that basic you know, philosophical level, um, like. I and just to just to jump in very quickly, yeah, the, in the nationalist yeah. label is equally problematic because, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I accept the nation state as a reality and, a, and as a useful. Sorry, my. It's okay. Don't uh, worry about as, 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 as a sort of a useful vehicle for structuring some of those sort of economic ends that I that I just shared with you. But it's for me the idea of like nationalism as a philosophy is kind of stupid. The nation states are sort of relatively modern invention. And um, to make that sort of the highest good, the highest end of your politics is, you know, not not something I'm interested in. So that's why I objected to that, to being labeled as a natcon. Right. Uh, and go on. and that I, was a sort of minor point. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I mean, I, I think it's worth making. I mean, I have, uh, I, I actually, I think after you asked for the correction, I read something that you'd written about um, Yoram Hazoni, who, who's the uh, you know, who's the sort of actual um, leading light, uh, intellectually maybe, of uh, of the NatCons. Mm -hmm. That uh, I think I actually uh, so I, I did this exchange with Yoram at uh, REO Magazine, where I, th I think I actually quoted what you wrote because because uh, because I think you did um, like I think you did nail him on like the the sort of big historical contradiction, which is okay. If you want to uh, to make opposition to liberalism uh, your your whole thing, right? You know, which which your arm certainly does. Uh, it is a little weird, right, that the contrast is with nationalism because historically these two things grew up uh, side by side uh, with with each right. other, right? That if you're if you're like, I don't know, Metternich, right? You know, in uh, in the in the early 1800s, right? You see these both. You see this is a sort of like twin subversive ideologies. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, within uh, within the Austro-Hungarian Empire, or whatever, and um, so yeah, so I think that's a I think that's a fair correction, but uh, but you do, I think, see rejection of of liberalism in in a really broad sense of that term uh, mm -hmm. as core, and I think as motivating both both your disagree both your uh, your economic disagreements uh, with. Mm -hmm. um, with right wingers who, you know, however conservative they might be on social policy or kind of libertarian about economics, uh, and also with your, left liberals. 
Yeah. Also yeah. your, your disagreements with people like me on stuff like abortion and gay marriage, right. You know, that like that, yeah. you, that you sort of see all of that stuff as, as growing out of, of, uh, of liberalism and of, of liberalism as, as a sort of, um, you know, fundamentally is a bad thing, right? Which, which, which I think is, is going to be the real core of the the disagreement, right? Because, because I think that, you know, if by liberalism somebody means like, um, you know, liberalism as a sort of political option in the United States in 2022, then yeah, I hate, I, I have, uh, you know, I don't like that either, right? You know, mm -hmm. that the, you know, what you mean is like the ideology of like centrist Democrats, or you know, like I think we can talk about liberalism as a sort of political force uh starting in the 19th century that has that was defined as much in opposition to socialism as it was to uh, in opposition to conservatism and so it's like yeah liberalism in that sense i don't like but like i think uh liberalism in the sense of certain kinds of um like what what somebody might be gesturing to if they talked about like enlightenment liberalism or something like that right you know i'm much friendlier towards and i would even sort of come out of the uh, tradition of um, of seeing you know socialism as as an attempt to sort of deepen the uh, and you know um, to, to sort fulfill of, liberalism's promises. Yeah, to fulfill yeah. liberalism's promises exactly yeah. right. Yeah. To to sort of in a in a sort of deeper way than like liberalism in the strict sense really could. Uh, so uh, so I, I think that's probably the most productive takeoff point. I mean, what's the what like like why? Yeah, you know, what's the sort of elevator pitch for what you know? Why is liberalism bad? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, um, as many critics of liberalism in the 19th century, um, some of the left and some of the, you know, kind of Catholic political theorists um, bizarrely converged on this point. Um, I, like them, don't make the separation between um, cultural and economic liberalism, right? So that um, the two, you can see very naturally how they, they go hand in hand, right? So in the sense that um, economic liberalism posits a rupture between market activity and political activity. Now, this is a, a preposterous rupture. Um, uh, it, it, you know, a touchstone book for me is Karl Polanyi's um, The Great Transformation, where, in fact, the bringing about of the autonomous market, you know better than I do, uh, involved enormous state coercion mm -hmm. and involved politics. Um, and so, uh, likewise, though, liberals also posit a kind of complete rupture between um, the culture as mm -hmm. such and, um, again, politics, that there's this realm of politics in which all the state does is uphold sort of neutral values and then culture can go in any direction they want. And cultural liberalism and economic liberalism, um, again, just like nationalism and liberalism mm -hmm. had in the 19th century went in tandem. And I would argue today they go in tandem together mm -hmm. in the sense that um, uh, if you if you want the state to mm -hmm. compass the economy, um, that also means taking care of um, you know what it means to be human and what, is there sort of some objective account of what it means to be human? So if you and I ally on certain mm -hmm. social democratic ends, I do it because I want to protect certain goods. Mm -hmm. um, uh, from the predations of the market, from coercion in the marketplace and so forth. Um, whereas if you deny, mm -hmm. as cultural liberalism ultimately does, that there are any ends, you know, any kind of ultimate ends or any sort of objective account mm -hmm. of human happiness that can be enshrined in law, if you do that, you, are, in fact, I argue, open up a space in which, um, you know, frankly, capital can can have its way even more, right? So if you, you 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 create a society in which no sort of objective account of what's a better form of life than another reigns, mm -hmm. that creates an ever more kind of fragmentary cultural sphere, which first of all can be uh, monetized. And so, mm -hmm. it became, so different dimensions of our life world become one more subject for capital to sort of mm -hmm. to, play around with and cater to um, and sort of create desires out of, that's troubling in itself. And second of all, it makes um, the building up, and this is kind of on the top of my mind because I'm writing a book right now about like, how do you attempt to rebuild the social democratic model? You, mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a cultural component of it, which is that you need to be able to, at the level of um, working class people, you have to be able to develop 
um, solidarity. And if the tendency of the culture is toward ever greater fragmentation and ever more sort of individualized desires, mm -hmm. it becomes harder to develop um, sort of uh, uh, solidarity, a class for itself, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's not, um, it, 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 I think it's very telling as a point I make, it's a very uncomfortable point in some ways for a right winger to make that um, a lot of actually existing socialist regimes have been culturally um, mm -hmm. conservative to say, to put it mildly. Um, I also disagree with the idea that stop making right wing social democracy happen because in many ways, as you know, um, social democracy was, um, it, it was sure, I mean, it's something, something that was spearheaded by a lot of uh, European socialists, but it also, you know, post-war, um, it secured the buy-in of a lot of people who were, you know, not, not, you know, necessarily culturally liberal, but they saw, they saw the need to, in, in some ways, in order for, for things to stay the same, some things economically had to change, mm -hmm. um, but they didn't, they didn't thereby become, um, cultural liberals or neoliberals as we would rec recognize them today. So I don't see why the two have to have to go together, mm -hmm. but it also doesn't stop me from increasingly seeking to, you know, to build alliances with people who, you know, mm -hmm. like you said, you know, if you if you can just make it to the MBA, um, right. there's some value in that. If you can build a, if you can build a consensus such that, for example, Eisenhower and Nixon, you know, more or less upheld the new deal and mm -hmm. extended its logic in some ways. Culturally, you know, they weren't with they weren't with the left of the time, and yet they mm -hmm. did that, and that was that was, you know, worthwhile. So, in terms yeah. of practical politics, the horizon needn't be as imaginative as Saraba Mari might be as a post-liberal. Yeah, so I, I think there there are two different threads of that, right? One is like, what's the sort of um, you know coherent vision of uh, of what we want to happen, right? Like 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 is is there a you know, is there a way of thinking about this where uh, the uh, you know wanting all of those th you know wanting all of the things that the those of us on the the libertarian left want uh, mm -hmm. and, you know in tandem makes sense uh, the uh, and uh, and then the other you know and then the other strand is the practical political strand which is like okay uh, as with that um, the um, you know that the uh, play on the Mean Girls uh, quote in the uh, in the title of, of the article uh, that I wrote uh, is um, is it going to happen? Like so so okay. So the first is like is social democracy plus cultural conservatism is that just a good vision in itself? That's one question. And then the second it. Is, is, it possible? Like, is it possible? Right? Like would yeah. it happen that way? And and one I think preliminary point I'd make on that second question is uh, I'd also like to address the second first. So sure. go on. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's start with the second one, right? So they have a. Um, so is that Eisenhower and Nixon uh, didn't seek to uh, to to overturn the New Deal, but I also think it's significant that Eisenhower, Nixon, nor people like them, were were the ones who achieved the New Deal, right? I think that the there's there's a. I, I think that even you know it's it's probably less of a tight analogy when you start to go into Western European countries uh, with more complicated histories, but even there, I think that. Um, these kinds of, you know, Christian democratic parties, for example, that, you know, that like bought into a lot of the basic framework of, of social democracy were by and large, not the, the people who fought to, to create it in the first place. Right. You know, that's, they, they sort of accept it. Right. I, I think that once you, and, you know, I mean, I think one of the nice things about, um, you know, sweepingly social democratic programs uh, and, you know, you, you kind of, you know, and I think everything you said about the new deal earlier is, correct right it's it's not it's I, I think it's a sort of um you know in some ways it's a pale shadow of the real thing but it's also the closest we got in the united states you know that um but one of the good things about the creation of of uh, those sorts of programs is that once they're in place it's very difficult politically to dislodge them right that the um in um you know i mean canadian conservatives don't run on an election manifesto of privatizing Canadian Medicare, you know the, the uh, you know British conservatives don't uh, you know don't don't run on election manifestos of privatizing the NHS because because uh, that would be wildly unpopular and they'd never, uh, they never they would never win right. So I think that once things have been put in place, then sure I think you're going to get a certain buy-in from uh, from across the spectrum of mainstream opinion because because just what's the you know the basic framework. Uh, is um, of of what's uh, of what's politically possible becomes different, 
uh, you know, but I, I also think it's I also think it's very difficult to see uh, a scenario whereby, you know, rather than the New Deal being created by Democrats who were in alliance with like militant CIO labor unions, uh, that um, that it was going to uh, that it was going to be created by by some sort of uh, proto proto Nixonites. And I particularly have a hard time seeing like right now at right, 2022. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm under no illusion that like a majority of the American public agrees with me about everything. Uh, the uh, that's 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 clearly not the case. But uh, there's you know there is a certain kind of uh, social democratic baseline that is is pretty popular. But then I think uh, trying to impose socially conservative policy preferences. I mean, certainly in America in 22 is is uh, is is pretty is pretty unpopular, right? I mean, we just we just saw, um, you know, like voters in Kansas, uh, you know, reject, uh, you know, reject uh, banning abortion, you know, like banning abortion by by an 18 point, uh, 18 point margin. Uh, you know, we have the overwhelming majority of Americans uh, support, uh, you know, support, uh, I, th I think fewer than 10% of Americans think that uh, marijuana should be completely illegal. Uh, the about three quarters uh, agree with the uh, the Supreme Court, you know, even though it was assailed at the time by conservatives as as like sort of judicial overreach overruling the people. About three quarters of Americans uh, agree with same sex marriage equality. So, uh, so certainly in in that specific context, it's very hard to, for me to see how um, you know the scenario by which you know you're going to um, get more buy in for the the popular part right the uh, the uh, the economic reforms by tying it to very unpopular culturally conservative ideas yeah th so that's not the goal um i i would grant you and grant you and even go further that mm -hmm. um, you are you're not going to see the kinds of economic reforms um that i want and that i'm sure you want um, mm -hmm. You're not going to see the right um, spearhead them. I think I've mm -hmm. been completely disillusioned. If you mention that debate, um, you know, in 2018, I was sort of still, um, you know, trying to imagine um, a Trump who um, would be more sort of social democratic than he um, turned out to be. I think the only sort of legislative thing that he enacted was a Paul Ryan tax cut, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, major legislative initiative um and I, since then i've become even even more disillusioned about that i mean i i sort of see um a doubling down on culture war um mm -hmm. culture war in this kind of blithe uh sense of it where it's like um you know uh we're against woke capital blah blah, blah. but in terms of actual material uh stances most of it is um it doesn't touch capital as such. It doesn't touch um, the power of the asset rich to coerce the asset less. Um, and so, you know, I, luckily, I'm not a Republican Party operative. I'm just mm -hmm. trying. I what I can do is is, you know, try to poke holes in where I where I see sort of a bogus pro worker um, cultural atmospherics playing. But in fact, you look behind it, and the agenda is the same old, same old. Um, I can try to point out that, uh, you know, at its, at his best, you, you, you might uh, cringe at this thought, but um, there were moments in the 2016 campaign mm -hmm. where, for example, Trump said, uh, uh, you know, speaking to Wisconsin public radio, uh, no, no, public radio, political radio in Wisconsin, which is to say Paul Ryan's home state. And he said, you know, Paul would want me to, you know, privatize this thing or raise the retirement. I'm not going to do any of that. You got to keep keep Social Security. Uh, we're not going to touch entitlements the way Republicans want to if I'm elected. Or remember the famous debate in Houston where um, Ted Cruz said something like, so you're, you're, you know, you're saying in order for people to not die on the street, you're sort of willing to contemplate socialist medicine. And Trump said, correct. I'm not going to, we're not going to let people die, you know, die on the street. Mm -hmm. um, so those were sort of promising moments of populism. Um, Obviously, they have a they they resonated because they you know there's mm -hmm. a large chunk of the uh, Republican base went for it. But I'm so yeah I'm not uh, on the whole though when it came to um, actually governing, 
you have the you know you have the Republican Party that you have, and so uh, the Department of Labor under Trump was um, pretty terrible and not much different than what like George W. Bush or Romney or whatever. Um, but so in on those cases, all I do is uh, you know as someone who is still broadly identified with the right, I make arguments for why you know some of the goods that you conservatives want. Would, be, would be better secured under a traditional social democratic program. And, um, you know, and, and in some cases, the, the I, I will say, you know, at least some of the sort of intellectual uh, architecture of the New Deal, you know, did have people who, um, I mean, certainly there was there was a sort of the militant labor unionists and, and genuine progressives at the time. Just one second, I apologize, having a daughter no problem whatsoever um all right let's see uh yeah i also see people in the chat pointing out um you know that uh britain and canada you know do do both have uh partial privatization um schemes that are floated or implemented like the sort of so-called reforms to the nhs over the decades and that's all true right but i mean the point is just that like no conservative uh, is going to be like you should elect me to Congress to Parliament. And I'm going to abolish the NHS, right? You know, no um, Canadian conservative is just going to say, yeah, I think we should just have America's healthcare system. I'm just going to outright completely privatize it, right? They do it slowly. They often do it stealthily. They often have to lie about what they're doing. Say, no, no, no. We want to preserve the basic structure of the NHS. We just, you know, we just need certain reforms to make it work better, or whatever. Which is, uh, which is a very different thing, right? From, uh, from just like outright openly opposing it, because you can't really outright openly oppose it and still be electorally viable in those countries. So, I think that's the distinction that I would make. Yeah, exactly, Hugh. That would be, um, you know, that would be wildly unpopular. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Charles, I, I do, you know, I do, I do think so. Right. I mean, obviously there are incredibly deep disagreements here, but, um, but, you know, but I, I think he's a, you know, I think he's a thoughtful guy. I think he, you know, I think he can defend it, uh, much, um, in a, in a much better, uh, and, uh, and different way, uh, in, uh, than, uh, than a lot of, uh, than a lot of other conservative guests, uh, you know, would be able to, so. You know, I've certainly found the conversation interesting. Um, all right, uh, Jake, what do you uh, guess? We uh, we have a uh, we have a minute here. Uh, the um, uh, while uh, while while, while Sora practices what he preaches about family values to. Uh, uh, to uh, I was gonna, I was going to say he yeah he might be back any second, but um, I, you're yeah. kind of already talking to the guest, but my produce my producerial suggestion was if anyone wants to sneak in a question because it's been a uh, it's a, oh oh a uh, sort of exciting no um, if anyone wants to sneak in a question uh, we haven't done a Q and A in a while uh, oh that's but, true that's true that's no, true that 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 was what I was thinking um, but yeah um, we need free universal uh, child care for inter for internet debates exactly uh, you know, where, where you can send <laughs> your yeah. All right, let's see. No, I think I think we're good. I think I. All right, you think he's back? Enough. If anyone wants to ask a question, put it in the chat, and then we'll answer it on the Patreon. The Patreon, and then you have to subscribe. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Good, good entrepreneurial hustle there. Uh, all right, we got Sora back. Sorry about that. No worries whatsoever. Live television. Um, you know, uh, the some of the architects of the New Deal and the intellectually mm -hmm. sort of like Gardner Means, and later, insofar as he became an explicator of the new new deal someone like john kenneth galbraith these were not men of the left and he just you mm -hmm. know galbraith explains countervailing power as a form of competition it's just the competition comes from the other side of the market right not <clears throat> in other words instead of competition between sellers of labor mm -hmm. or between buyers of labor the competition comes from the other side right people who are subjected mm -hmm. to the power to the original power of employers can mm -hmm. mount countervailing power and so it's a very sort of realistic argument and that takes, um, ultimately, you know, builds a consensus beyond just the left mm -hmm. in the 1950s, 60s. That's valuable if you can do that right, sure. on the right. Um, that's all I'm saying, right? Oh, like, yeah. you can critique, you can try to build a consensus, and you can be pretty pessimistic, as, as I, in fact, I am. And so I've written cases, pieces where I've said, you know, 
a lot of this pro worker right is uh, sort of the the propaganda is that just that it's bullshit right it's that yeah. as soon as a sort of actual union battle comes these pro worker senators for the most part are you know conspicuous by their absence and and their silence so and yeah. i grant you that i don't know what else to say yeah and I, I would also put as if either of them win i would also put uh jd vance and black masters in that category maybe you disagree but that would um that would definitely uh be my assessment but but i do want to um I do want to uh, switch gears a little bit because I want to make sure we have a few minutes before before you go to mm -hmm. uh, to talk about you know we've, we've the desirability of, of the thing yeah the desirability right because we've yeah. kind of been talking about political strategy yeah. but um, but there's there's also again I mean to the extent that like a big part of what is clearly motivating you right mm -hmm. is um, is this this sort of more general uh, you know, critique of, uh, of liberalism, right? You know, they have, uh, and, and I think you said a few things earlier when you were, you were kind of laying out that, uh, that case, right. You know, what you, um, you know, what you, uh, you know, what you see as, as, as wrong with it. And, uh, at least some of that, I think has to, you know, you talked about whether you sort of see things as like fundamental goods that, you know, that, that, uh, that society should, uh, should try to promote, or whether there's some sense in which you think that the the state can and should be uh, be neutral about mm -hmm. uh, about questions like that, and um, you know, and and I would think, look, there are uh, you have to, in a certain sense, you have to take it question by question because there are things that the state can't be neutral about. That they uh, that um, I mean, I think the obvious case is, you know, distribution of limited material resources. That you know, by definition, if you're um, you know if if you're um, if if one person you know has it the other person doesn't and you know and you have to enforce you know you have to enforce some sort of distribution of resources mm -hmm. and whether you're enforcing the one that already exists or you know or you're enforcing a different one i, th I think um on the level of like is this coercive I, I actually don't think that makes a big uh a big difference so in a case like that i think no i mean uh, any state is going to enforce something right we just have to argue about what it would be good to enforce whereas in other cases uh, it seems like there are subjects that the uh, that this the state can be uh, can be quite neutral about, right? I mean, religion being an obvious case, right? That the uh, that um, you know you're a uh, a practicing Catholic uh, mm -hmm. and the um, you know in a majority Protestant country, but uh, but we uh, but um, but the the state doesn't doesn't take a position on uh, on that uh, on that split one way or the other, and that's a good thing. Uh, that the uh, you know, the idea that, you know, people can, um, you know, people can marry uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the partner of, uh, of their choice that the, uh, that if you, you know, that if you want to, uh, to, to, you know, have a, uh, have a giant family and, you know, and, and go to church with them every week and all that stuff, you can do that if you, uh, if you want to, uh, you know, if you, if you want to spend, uh, you know, every night clubbing, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can do that. And these are things that seems like the state can be neutral about, uh, that those, those kinds of decisions. And I think there's even a principled way to think about this, right. Which is, you know, t which is, um, the sort of distinction that somebody like Rawls would make about justice, uh, as something that like applies to state institutions uh, as opposed to individual life plans, which are things that, uh, you know, that, that state institutions don't actually have to, uh, to, to take a side on, right? That you can have, um, you know, what you think counts as a good life for individuals, you know, that we can, you know, let a hundred flowers bloom there, right? But, the, uh, but what counts as a just way of organizing basic institutions, of distributing material resources, et cetera, is the uh, is the sort of thing where one way or the other you're going to to be taken aside and you should, and 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 it and it does seem to me that there is there is a there is at least a coherent and uh, plausible sounding to me way of saying, you know, what's the what's the point, right? When we're when we're promoting, um, you know, when we're promoting uh, economic reforms, a more uh, a more materially just society. Uh, what's the what's the program of saying? Well, the the ultimate program can can be to say that we actually want people to have more uh, autonomy, more ability to control what happens uh, in their uh, in their own lives. And realistically, uh, if you have um, you know, I mean, if you have most people uh, have to spend 
half their waking lives and you know in workplaces uh, where where they don't own the place and you have and you don't even have you know strong unions or regulatory state and all that to mitigate that situation ultimately i'd like to do more than mitigate it but I, you know just as a as a starting point uh then that gives people much less control over their lives so i mean they you know where and but similarly if we're saying no uh you know you you can't marry that person because we've decided that a good life is is one that's uh is is one that's defined by heterosexual monogamy so if you're you know if you're gay you know you you and your boyfriend can't get married uh then we're also uh limiting people's people's ability to uh to live like their lives in the way that they should and and uh and we shouldn't do that like that's uh you know we have a better society if if people can can make their own experiments in uh in in living and we don't we don't sort of try to impose them from the from the top down uh any uh and you know like a particular a particular vision of the the good life so a couple of answers to that one is um the answer from ordinary experience today is mm -hmm. um i think life in the United States over the past few decades has, if anything, um, underscored how impossible it is to achieve the kind of neutrality um, as to different visions of good life that you are, um, that, that liberal theory mm -hmm. uh, aspires to. Um, any society, this is sort of a very kind of, is a very pre-modern insight, it's a very ancient mm -hmm. insight that human beings are, among other things, you know, we're political animals, we're rational animals, and we're also religious animals. That is, people mm -hmm. seek to erect some monument or other in the public square so that even the most ardently godless regimes have a sort of public liturgy and, a, and essentially enshrine using uh, you know, public symbols and so forth um, what they actually think is, is the good life. And I would argue that over the past, um, especially since sort of this... Um, era of very aggressive liberalization and what you see as um you you probably see it as, as a sort of a, uh completely divorced from mm -hmm. economic liberalization i see as sort of again things mm -hmm. you know these sort of uh, liberation in the boardroom and the bedroom mm -hmm. sort of happen to go together. the center left has generally pushed the one the center right has promoted the other um and um ever since that's happened um the public culture has changed and um you know uh, it's become more coercive for people who are who have to hold non-liberal beliefs about these different issues i don't i mean i think it's pointless for us to sort of mm. litigate the underlying substantive issue this is why this is bad that's good whatever but that just to, to note that um the once the autonomy claims are granted that's mm -hmm. not where the um sort of liberal horizon of liberation ended it then became a matter of well you know you know so in certain public settings you have to say you have to say the one thing and if you don't you might be um sort of unpersoned from social media um now the the classical liberal would say but that's a you signed the terms of service as a private i don't make those sort of sharp distinctions between public and private um or uh, uh you know you know, the bake the cake is a sort of classic classic mm -hmm. example and so all that's to say that is that um um i welcome politics on these issues and let's let's mm -hmm. have a genuine contest of of political views and not litigate them or attempt not to even have the uh, political contest the way liberalism does which is to um always transmute debates about fundamental mm -hmm. issues into questions about sort of rights you know, market circulation, et cetera, et cetera, rather than genuine confrontations. Um, the confront, if you, if you, you know, if I'm within a liberal frame, if I'm granted the ability to, uh, you know, make the uh, confrontation at least, or to make the the case, mm. it might be take take us halfway, but we're not, and that to me proves that um, that uh, that the autonomy. Um, uh, sorry, the neutrality promised by liberalism is often very illusory. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll stop there. I mean, I think I had a, I had a second line of thought, but I'm, I'm, I have my eye on my daughter. I'm really sorry I took this on a night where I don't. No, that's 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 okay. 
that's she's, that's that's she's okay. Doing something catastrophic there, but I won't tell you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I can't well, tell you what it is. We'll wrap up in the next couple of minutes, but okay. I have a, I, I did just um, uh, you know, it's uh, I I don't uh, it's, I, my wife is going to be very angry at me because she's going to tell me what she do, but <laughs> I'm really sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry, honey. Uh, okay. I, I had we'll make to, it work. I, I I had to uh, I had to Talk go. To ben Burgess. You know, I had to go on on uh, Marx's podcast and you know and argue about uh, you know uh, the good life. So uh, I'm sorry about what she did to the house. But yeah, uh, yeah. So I would I would just um, I would just point out, I, I guess, real briefly, right? Because because you yeah. do need to go, right? I would just point out that the. Um, that in practice, in a lot of places, uh, you've seen the opposite uh, trend going together, that they have that uh, places like um, Sweden and Norway uh, are are among the most secular and culturally liberal uh, countries on earth and in, uh, in some ways uh, at the same time as uh, as having, you know, even now, right, despite, you know, countervailing trends decades, despite having, um, you know, despite or maybe even because of Right, that's an interesting discussion to have sometime. Uh, but you know, but certainly as a matter of fact, both are true. Right, you know that they have these uh, really strong unions, really expansive welfare states, uh, and, uh, and they're also much more secular societies than uh, than the uh, the United States is. Um, so I, I do, um, you know, I, I think well, that I, the, I, would, I, I would sort of empirically argue that you know, sure, whatever, that the, sure, actually the Nordic countries have gone quite neoliberal since the 1990s and the aughts, but you're right, because, well, because compared, of, compared, to, it, compared to Sweden, compared the 70s, to what? Compared, Sweden compared. today is, you know, compared sure. to the United States today, Sweden today uh, is uh, is certainly uh, is, is certainly still one of the most social democratic countries. But, uh, uh, here, here's, here's the bottom line. I mean, this is the second yeah. point I wanted to make before I was distracted sure. by the catastrophe sure. unfolding in the corner of my living room, is that um, you know, you mentioned, you know, well, socialism is about allowing experiments yeah. of living. Yep. Liberalism provides that provide for that much better. Cap liberalism as the ideology of capital does a much better job of providing for experiments capital. Oh, you want to like, do this and that here. It's a it's a sort of commoditized lifestyle. You want well, to do that. Even, even religion kind of can become yeah. uh, uh, one more sort of mm -hmm. lifestyle thing that, that's marketed to you. So. I just don't see. I, th I think a, a more solidaristic way of life means an emphasis on community, and a community needs a true political community needs at least some sort of sense of coherent, uh, some sort of cohesion about. So, what is it that unites us together as a as a people? I'm not saying, therefore, political Catholicism. Really, I'm not. But just making a bare minimum case that if you're um, uh, you know, the basis of of solidarity of, of any kind of communitarianism requires agreement on some fundamental things and um, experiments in living, which is John Stuart Mill's. Um, I, I, by the way, it's a very kind of horrendous thing to think about it to turn life into a into an experiment. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, experiments it's can go wrong. It's, it's horrendous <laughs> to experiment on uh, on somebody against their will. Uh, it's uh, I would argue it's not horrendous for people to be allowed to make their own experiments. And I think as John Stuart Mill himself realized as he, uh, as he became more socialist, uh, as, uh, as he went on, uh, that, uh, that you have, um, is, is that, um, you know, socialism provides the promise of, uh, fully funded experiments and living, not just being like, look, I mean, it's like telling, uh, it's like telling a physics grad student, yeah, you can do whatever experiments you want if you can like scrape together the money on your own for the you know large hydron collider you know that you're going to privately purchase. Uh, and I think that you know I, I think that under uh, conditions of neoliberal economic precarity, I think that people both um, on the one hand have trouble uh, keeping together relationships because of financial stress, but on the other hand uh, will stay in bad or even abusive relationships uh, because because uh, they can't afford to move out. Uh, and uh, that's that's one, I think, small example in how those things could, uh, you know, how those goals could go together from my perspective. But uh, I do want to be sensitive to the fact that, uh, you know, there's some sort of chaos going on. Uh, it's really bad. It's really bad. I won't even tell you what it is, but it's a, <laughs> so it's a three year old running naked around the house. So. <laughs> I will, I will let you go. Uh, I'm really we, sorry that I had to do that. Is, like that is okay. That, that, 
Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so um, where can where can people find you and your stuff? Uh, just compactmag.com. All right. Very good. Uh, Thanks, I will I will talk to you. I will talk to you again. Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, we are going to go early to the post game uh, because it is, after all, Labor Day, as, uh, as some people are pointing out in the chat. Uh, you know, usually we uh, skip this entirely, but since we had to skip last week, we didn't want to skip uh, this week. So, uh, so, so me and the rest of the Liberty and Left uh, will be going to the post game for patrons, which is going to be a much shorter post game. So, you know, we're ending the main show about half an hour early, and we'll probably only do about half an hour or so for uh, for the post game. Uh, and um, but uh, we have stuff to get to in the post game. Uh, we have. Uh, Anna Kasparian issuing a debate challenge to uh, Dennis Prager, who you'll remember uh, says that he aches to uh, debate leftists. We have some Ben Shapiro stuff. And uh, we have uh, Jake uh, having uh, become the longest lasting GTA producer. He's, uh, he's, been at it, uh, he's been at it for a full year. So we are going to raise a glass to, uh, to toast that. All of that is coming up in the post game. If you're a patron, you should already have that link. If you are not yet a patron, that is patreon.com slash Ben Burgess, uh, five bucks a month, uh, cost of a milkshake at a 50s nostalgia diner in 1994. Uh, you can get the uh, patron exclusive post game after every regular episode tonight and every other Monday. Uh, you get access to the Discord server. Sometimes you get bonus episodes. Uh, you get all kinds of things, but mostly you get our undying love and gratitude for helping us to keep this uh, going. And with that, left is best. <laughs>